Ja, herzlich willkommen für alle. Welcome to you for all of you who had lunch, short lunch. Uh, my name is Christian Foster. I'm a managing director of Apex Rail, a young independent consulting enterprise for financing of rolling um, uh, stock and uh, railway infrastructure. Well, a few words of introduction for the strategic session regarding uh, Industry 4.0 and ecological uh, revolution due to new technologies in the uh, railway sector. would like to welcome you to three interesting presentations focusing on an issue of great importance, the new Silk Road as one belt, one road, uh, a link between context that is a really um, a, talking matter for everybody, how to create an efficient rail link between Europe and Asia, how can Twin City region in Vienna, uh, Bratislava position itself as a hub. This ties in with uh, the uh, wide gauge connect, uh, connection between Kosice and Vienna, Bratislava. These issues on the questions, uh, these questions and the answers will uh, concern us for the next 45 minutes, the Belt and Road Initiatives, that wants to create a new link between the continents. That's a very important issue of discussion in many countries. We've got three high-level speakers. And I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, Professor Andreas Breinbauer, Rector at uh, BFI, University of Applied uh, Sciences in Vienna. He will speak uh, about this issue uh, and uh, its dimensions and effect. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here today, and I would like to give you a short overview of the Belt and Road Initiative, and I would like to uh, present this uh, session to initiate this session at a high level of abstraction, you might say. First, I will speak about the creation of the new Silk Road Initiative, the Belt Road Initiative, its modifications, its key uh, core elements. Uh, I will um, compare it with other Chinese strategies. I will mention, speak about infrastructure investment as a visible part of the uh, BRA. I. Uh, Austria, we have uh, conducted a study on how uh, Austrian logistics enterprises view this initiative. And uh, finally, I would like to give a short overview of the opportunities and risks. Uh, a few words uh, regarding the history of the initiative. President Xi Jinping held uh, one uh, spe uh, speech at the Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan and he created a links to the historical Silk Road and commented that the combination of different peoples, religions, and uh, cultures were very, was very successful in the context of the old Silk Road, and this should be revived. In this first speech, he mentioned five uh, principles of the Belt Road initiatives, namely policy, increased political trust, and political cooperation. Connectivity, that is improved connectivity and infrastructure, trade facilitation, improvement of uh, trade uh, connections, monetary circulation, improvement of uh, the financial system, and finally, not to forget, uh, last but not least, people-to-people uh, -people exchange, improvement of uh, interpersonal contacts. So this first speech uh, mentioned infrastructure as an important one of uh, five important elements during it, it is a second speech um, uh, before the Indonesian parliament. Um, in uh, 2013, he presented the 21st maritime, uh, century maritime Silk Road, and uh, both uh, speeches uh, provided uh, the uh, launching pad for the One Belt, One Road initiative, or Belt and Road initiative, as it uh, is now called. So. Uh, in uh, 2014, it uh, was announced that a new bank would be established, the In Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and the, the first projects of finance through it were, were started in 2016. That was uh, followed by the Silk Road Fund. Uh, Irma, uh, 
provided with $20 billion, and after that, we learned that, that, that the, then uh, in March 2015, Vision's action on jointly building Silk Road economic wealth and 21st century maritime Silk Road was published, an important paper that uh, uh, focuses on a points that are very important, namely that that all participating countries would mutually benefit, start a mutually beneficial cooperation with countries Asia, Europe, and Africa, and the rest of the world. So it's an invitation to all countries of the world to participate. And the, uh, this initiative is open to all countries and international regional organizations for engagement. It's not only open to countries, but also to in, uh, international and regional organizations. Well, a joint communique of the Belt Road Conference in Peking on 15th of May 2017. This issue was opened up even further by containing an innovation action plan for e-commerce, a sharing economy, digital economy, smart cities, development improvement of global value creation chains, business startups, and technology parts. All these were proposed for countries, especially for countries willing to participate in the initiative. Also, the commitment to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals resulted from this as well. Therefore, the Belt of the Road Initiative is thematically open, is not limited in time, contrary to other Chinese strategies. It's not limited in the regional sense, so it's an invitation to all countries and organizations. There are hardly any official maps, Chinese maps. It's a work in progress. Uh, it is uh, supported financially, dipl uh, politically, and uh, diplomatically, and it defines itself not as an initiative, as an initiative, and not as a strategy, not as a Marshall Plan, because it's very often uh, viewed as similar in the Western discourse. No, it's viewed uh, as a win-win situation that would generate mutual benefits in the countries that are willing to participate, but in other countries as well. I think it's very important to um, compare this uh, Belt and Road Initiative with other strategies, such as going global from 2000, when Chinese in, in, uh, companies, also state-owned companies, were encouraged to uh, invest outside uh, China, uh, foreign direct investment. Um, to establish Chinese players to uh, secure uh, raw materials and energy sources, and uh, state-owned enterprises are given a great uh, uh, primary role. Another strategy was made in China 2025, 20, uh, which was also complemented by communications of the Ministry of Commerce here. It uh, was mentioned that the share of Chinese industrial product in high-tech as sectors are to increase to 70% uh, of uh, production in 2025. We should not forget the 13 five-year plan, which extends uh, from uh, 2016 to 2020, uh, which envisages the doubling of the real GDP of 2010 by 2020, which... Uh, must be underpinned by a real economic growth of 6.5%. And it's mentioned that uh, the, uh, ma uh, the economy of China was to be restructured into an innovation-driven economy. And another plan, Chinese dream, uh, China is to uh, prosper and become rich, uh, strong, and powerful comprehensively by 2049. Now, the question is, what is the dimension of uh, the BR? I, it's a thematically and geographically open, and therefore it's difficult to define, and therefore it's difficult to define its dimensions. Uh, the uh, Makati Institute uh, for Chinese Studies in Germany established a lower limit that would uh, correspond to the volume uh, of uh, infrastructure investment of Chinese enterprises up to now, uh, projects that have already been implemented that would correspond to 25 billion USD, uh, of which 750 million in 16 Central and Eastern European countries. This is a map that I think you are uh, familiar with, with the various routes, the Northern Route, the Central Route, and th uh, Route and Thoughts, uh, also 
to regarding central rules. Uh, this involves not only countries of Africa and Eurasia, but also infrastructure projects also in uh, South America, Latin America, which are about to be planned. Now, if we look at the green points as projects that have been completed, the red ones at projects uh, under pl in, in planning and not yet completed. Then you can see a few uh, focuses. One of them is Pakistan. This is really a model project of the BRI. Um, 40 billion euro were invested. 50% have already been completed. Another focal point is Southeastern Europe. The volume is uh, smaller here, and all also Southeast Asia. These are most important trans uh, transport corridors, I think, will be known to you. You are experts. Uh, we're talking about the uh, uh, upgrading of a network between Asia and Europe, involving the very important players, Russia, Kazakhstan, and uh, the Central Asian republics. Another uh, method uh, of uh, gauging the dimensions of the BRI lies in um, looking at Chinese investments and construction contracts and counting them in, in those countries that can be uh, considered part of the Belt Road Initiative. Now, which the question arises, which country does participate to the, in the Silk Road? There is no official list, as you know. Uh, but sometimes um, a country list of the Belt and Road portal is used as an indicator by ex experts. It's a semi-official list of countries that feel close to the project, and this list has become longer because in 2017 there were 65 countries listed. Um, in uh, 2018, uh, last October, 85. Uh, for the first time, Austria as well. And on the Chinese side, uh, China already li lists 116 countries on, um, on this list. There's also a memorandum of understanding between China and Italy, so Italy will be included on, in this list very soon. Now, if we look at financing, how is Belt and Road financed? I've already presented the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank AIIB, well, there's both multilateral financing via uh, the Silk uh, Road Fund of the AIIB and uh, via the New Development Bank, MBD. Um, we we're talking about the total about 200 billion do um, US dollars, but uh, the largest part is financed through uh, Chinese state sources. Um, or the China Development Bank, uh, China Bank of Construction, ICBC, and these are the key funders of infrastructure pro uh, projects. Here we've got the strong dominance of Chinese companies that benefit from these subsidies. While in the case of multilateral funding, uh, well, uh, China ha uh, holds uh, actually only a map pays only for a minority of the projects. Now, if we look at the Silk Road countries according to the above definition and the Chinese investment volume, we can see that since 2005 the volume has markedly increased and is now 250 to 300 billion euros annually. And we look uh, also the share that has been invested in Europe has increased as well. If we look at the industries worldwide, and also for the period from uh, 13 to uh, 2013 to 2018, you will notice that transport is a dominant sector as well as energy and the agricultural sector. In all, the total volume. Uh, is $1.9 billion from 2005. Uh, since uh, 2013, it's $1.13 uh, trillion, and only one-fourth goes to the transport and logistics sector. We've got a similar situation in Europe. The total volume is $360 billion US dollars, one-fourth in logistics and transport, and about the 260 a uh, billion US dollars since 2013 invested in uh, the transport sector. Now, this uh, Chinese 
initiative supports an immense objective uh, infrastructure need. Why? Front functioning infrastructure is uh, the backbone of any economic development and able to attract companies. Here's an objective great demand, uh, especially in Asia, which is estimated by the Asian Development Bank uh, to uh, 26 trillion uh, US dollars by 2030. And China has done a great deal in this field and has also motivated uh, other uh, institutions, such as the Asian Development Bank, which is dominated by the US or the World Bank, are beginning as co competitors also to finance such projects. Input and export, uh, I think, will be uh, spoken about by my uh, second, by the second speaker, but the Chinese so-called uh, initiative has also motivated European think tanks to motivate similar things in Europe and this is one of the ideas of the uh, uh, one of the ideas of European uh, Silk Road again investment volume 1 trillion euros uh, we expect that this will lead to a better development of the industrial centers in the West and the population-rich regions in, uh, in the East. The model split between the EU and China is currently largely covered by sea transport, 98%, uh, while uh, railways uh, stand at only 1%. Uh, according to a study by the European Development Bank, and this is why we need to have a great potential here to augment the sector, especially because uh, the uh, demand is changing. Mm, uh, there's a need to receive goods uh, within 20 or 25 days, and since there is a great support uh, of uh, subsidies of China, um, that has has led to uh, a decrease in prices, and now there are container transports between Vienna and uh, Shanghai, where we've got a cost of four thousand uh, dollars, and this means that the difference between uh, sea transport and land transport is no longer so great. Great, but of course, it's much shorter now. We conducted a study among Austrian um, entrepreneurs regarding logistics entrepreneurs regarding the BRI, and uh, largely most of them think that this project is extremely important. And managers are also quite uh, well in feel quite well informed. Seventy-six percent of uh, the um, respondents re consider Belt Road Initiative as important or very important for the business success, but still in Austria, uh, this is still lagging behind behind other issues such as digitalization, lack of uh, manpower, innovative technologies, new business models, and sustainability, but it is growing in importance. Now, how do Austrian logistics enterprises view the opportunities of various uh, uh, business areas? in the next 13 years, and uh, everybody believes, 88% believe, that uh, the um, uh, railways will benefit from uh, these developments. The expected effects of PRA on uh, Austria as a business location, this is viewed as very positive, or rather positive than more than 80%. Yeah. Opportunities and risks, well, the opportunities and risks, well, the opportunities, improvement of trade connections, more transport volume, new business volumes, Austria might become a logistics hub. Risks, uh, well, include intensification of competition and modal shift towards the railways, which should be a good thing for you, and that this might lead to distortions of competition. I will not uh, uh, speak in detail about this transparency, but there is also kind of a summary by, by the Chinese about five years PRA from the Chinese viewpoint. And here I would like to emphasize, again, it's a five-column model. And infrastructure is one of five elements, because it's also about people-to-people -people exchanges, about improvement of connectivity. Here it's, it's stated that uh, railway links have increased most strongly. 
here it says in the Chinese uh, summary, and that 10,000 uh, trains travel between 48 Chinese cities and 42 uh, country, uh, cities in 14 countries of Europe. But of course, they're subsidized very generously by the Chinese state. Now, what are the opportunities and risks of BRI? From my viewpoint, opportunities in the medium term, there are faster and more cost efficient infrastructure. This, in fact, increases prosperity for all. BRI investments are, in a way, also guarantors of stability in politically volatile regions, a kind of dividend of peace, you might say. Uh, enterprises can benefit from the general investment boost and it, uh, business of, of opportunities in the high-tech gaps made in China um, are also uh, a given, but there are some risks uh, at the moment. For example, investments in China uh, by Europeans are more difficult than expected. It is a fear that this might lead to um, indebtedness by small countries. European Chamber of Commerce uh, in China has stated that Chinese financed infrastructure projects are not sufficiently transparent, although there are some improvements to be noted. There is, my could also say, say that it is opportunities and risks are balanced, and I think uh, they offer good, uh, good possibilities of success if projects are well financed. So I think BRI is a gigantic, ambitious, multidimensional project and infrastructure is an important but not uh, the only one, the visible part of the BRA. It covers a great need for infrastructure investment in Europe, Asia and Eurasia and has created a push for other banks such as ADP or the World Bank to uh, uh, take this issue on board and invest more in uh, Asia. Also, there's the idea uh, of a European uh, Silk Road initiative late, but still, it's, it's been done. So this uh, generates a win-win situation, especially in multilaterally funded projects. And this means also that a railway transport uh, uh, holds very high transport in this concert. In this context, uh, in view of the growing transport volume, and it's for specific goal. Therefore, I think the quick uh, upgrading of railway links is absolutely desirable uh, towards, this, uh, towards this goal. Thank you very much, Professor. Unfortunately, we have no time for any questions since we're running very late. Now, uh, the uh, Broad gauge uh, railway has been mentioned uh, is in order to create a link between Vienna and Bratislava. And in this way, uh, we can develop uh, the Twin City region. Mr. Alexander Schierhuber will give us an overview of, uh, of uh, th these developments. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming here at such short notice because actually it was to be uh, an, a, an exclusive stakeholder event. Since we got so many um, applications, we were promoted to panel, you might say. Thank you. But this also shows that this project is meeting with more and more interest. Why? In the con uh, context of this conference, uh, this project has been mentioned several times, the project that, that I will be talking about it uh, also, um, as you may have read in the newspapers, uh, yesterday another agreement was concluded, uh, MOU was uh, concluded between Austria, uh, the Russian Federation and the Republic of Slovakia that uh, will uh, safeguard the further development of the wide gauge planning uh, association. It's a quadrilateral joint uh, venture from uh, of the uh, state uh, railways of Ukraine, uh, Russian Federation, Slovakia, and Austria, with the objective of bringing the uh, wide gauge railway from Kozice to the Vienna Bratislava twin region. Why? Well, we are convinced that this uh, the cargo pressure will continue. And we here in the Twin City region are actually the ideal uh, location in order to assure efficient distribution of these goods. In 2017, 
we uh, concluded our feasibility studies, and this is really our idea because we think that it is absolutely necessary. The uh, goods uh, freight pressure is cannot be stopped. Uh, the project can be implemented, technically speaking, and of course, it's an economic win-win situation. Profitability is uh, clearly documented by this uh, feasibility study, and it is this economic profitability that is the main uh, motivation behind this project. One belt, one road initiative that was briefly uh, sketched on, on this uh, map uh, continues, and Austria, Slovakia, uh, and Slovakia really have to do the homework. I call it homework because there are some gaps that remain and uh, in order to close these in intermodal uh, lacune. And uh, this uh, uh, still, uh, the region would be ideal for distributing both Chinese uh, goods in Europe and also to transport uh, European goods to China from this uh, our region, Twin City region. Now, the trade balances are very clear. This is not a one-way road. We operate uh, uh, at eye level, so to speak, and on equal footing. And it offers a, the project offers a great possibility for Austrian uh, companies to export their goods to um, Eastern Asia, to China and Kazakhstan. As uh, we know, the uh, Republic of China has uh, brought 150 million people to live in middle class, and it will still continue. It's still one of the great, greatest market of luxury goods. High quality European goods are very much in demand in China. And these products, high quality products, cost intensive products, are ideal to be transported via rail. Because the current uh, consumption behavior, of course, is characterized by shorter and shorter cycles. And therefore, we need short transit times. Uh, goods transport has, um, well, been uh, damped, you might say, uh, in uh, this um, area, and this area between Kosciuszko and Vienna. Uh, the transport volume will increase to 90 million tons per year by 2050. So uh, if we look at the development between Europe and Asia, we will soon uh, actually exceed the 300 tons level. And in trains, this means that by 2030, transport trains will uh, increase by, uh, by four times. So we should not be afraid of this development. It's major, but we should view it as an opportunity to uh, see, um, to establish this region, uh, Twin City region, as a wave breaker and to a scheme of uh, the value added for our two countries. What does this mean? In the uh, long run, we've already a short um, overview of uh, the development. We have guests from CCCC here, and the People's Republic of China is in the midst of great uh, development. But you should not forget that Europe is growing as well. It's in the logistics sector, in the service sector, Austria uh, is in the fourth place by the World Bank uh, ranking as the most important logistics country, although we are a landlocked country. This uh, underlines the high quality standards and uh, facilities that we offer and really encourages to go on with this project. Key numbers, why do we do what we do? Transport time is decreased from 30 to 4. 15 days, and there's, of course, of course, the green aspect, because there will never be any uh, alternative to uh, railway traffic. So it would be uh, actually a step backwards not to opt for, tra for trains. And this is, of course, uh, for the benefit of uh, all Eurasia. So. This is the overview of the Twin City region. Why is it such an attractive place for goods distribution? We have a meeting point of the three most important railway corridors of Europe. So this means not only to switch from wide to normal gauge, but also to establish terminals in the, in the best suited area in all of Europe. Again, so these are the location factors 
in addition to the three Tenti corridors, there's the Danube as well, and therefore, uh, imported waterway route, we've got two airports in Vienna and Bratislava, so even intermodal transport gets a new dimension. We have, we not only combine two gauge systems, but also provide uh, important uh, nodes regarding air traffic and road traffic, of course, uh, due to our motorways. Now, a few figures regarding macroeconomic figures. The benefits of, of this project for Austria and Slovakia, we create more than 20,000 workplaces in the two countries. We will create additional value of uh, 30 billion euros. I don't know if anybody from the Austrian Ministry of Finance is here, but you know, of course, this means 10 billion of taxes in excess. So everybody uh, who participates in the project will stands to benefit. And these figures are very conservative estimates. We know that a logistics factor will increase in Austria, that is an increasing demand. And we know that this project, precisely this project, uh, further safeguards our Austria as a business location. So to summarize, we've always said, there's a necessity for what we're doing. It's technically feasible, and this is due to the Austrian and Slovak know-how, and profitability is evident as well. So, by taking the steps that we've taken in the course of this conference, uh, conference by signing the MOU, by initiating the uh, strategic uh, transfer evaluation and assessment, and uh, the uh, preliminary uh, uh, EIP, uh, EEI uh, process in Slovakia has brought us on a very good road politically, ecologically, and also financially. And so we'll no longer be a bottleneck. And why aren't we? This will be documented by Judith Schreiber Obermeier because that has always been an issue. How can the security of Austria as a business location be demonstrated? And I'm very happy that uh, ÖBB and the Republic of Austria have created the frame conditions uh, to enable us to cope with the challenges that are facing us for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Schierhofer. As we've seen, this is a great opportunity for the future, which we can now also influence so that uh, the uh, project of this dimension can be covered. Um, this, however, also requires the right uh, regulatory framework conditions and the list of projects that take so long and uh, also have lots of uh, bureaucratic obstacles. So how fit is Austria as a location for that? And the answer to that uh, is provided by Mrs. Obermeier Schreiber in the next presentation of this series. She is a lawyer with the Austrian uh, Confederation of Industrialists uh, with special expertise on infrastructure and uh, legal questions related to major projects. So can you please uh, uh, start your presentation? Thank you very much. A very good afternoon also on my behalf. The previous uh, speakers or the previous speaker has impressively shown the numerous opportunities of the Broad Gorge uh, project. Let us just think of the uh, shortened transport routes and also the shift of the goods to rail, as well as strengthening uh, the region as a whole. So that uh, these positive impulses can then also have uh, an effect in reality, we also require projects of this kind to be implemented within a um, adequate period. This, of course, also requires the permission procedures that are completed within adequate time. Unfortunately, to date, in the past, numerous uh, important uh, location-related projects were delayed uh, by years and decades of red tape. Let us just think of the th uh, third uh, um, uh, runway project after 12 years with a hor horrible effects for the location 
for instance, a loss of 30,000 jobs uh, that are not created, and the hub function of Vienna Airport, the headquarter function in the greater central, uh, greater Vienna area, and the export oriented Austrian industry. This decision, which at the time rejected the third runway, not only had the negative effects we described on the location, but also negative effects uh, uh, with respect to making investors uh, uncertain about legal stability in Austria. We have carried out a survey which has shown that 90% of investors doubt uh, the competitiveness of Austria as a business location following that decision. This is also shown from our panel 50, a survey that we carry out each quarter by the Confederation of Industrialists amongst 50 panelists uh, from the business world and finance. Unfortunately, I don't have a laser pointer here, but still you can see from the blue curve uh, that we're seeing a strong decline after this uh, objection to the third runway. Aren't there any deadlines for these procedures? Yes, there are. Six, nine or twelve months subject to the project. There are legal uh, deadlines, but the problem is that there are no consequences if the deadlines are not met in reality. You can see that here very nicely using a different example from a different very important project for the location that is the 380 um, line in Salzburg allowing uh, to close up all Austrian lines. You can see that the legal deadline would have been nine months, but actually the um, it is stretched on for 33 months. We're seeing wrong developments in Austria uh, with regard to environmental impact assessments, as you can he see here from this uh, picture. Between 2014 and 17, the number of um, assessments has more than halved. On the other hand, uh, the average length in months has more than doubled. You can see that something is going wrong here. Luckily, the federal government has uh, taken up uh, this problem, which is why we are also having numerous points uh, in the government program including the general acceleration of assessment procedures for the implementation of infrastructure projects and major investments, the um, establishment and approval of a location development process, or the simplification of approval procedures in general. The location development uh, concept is also then uh, mentioned in detail in the government program with the objective of defining targets and principles for integrated integrated location development in Austria with the definition of infrastructure projects which are of strategic uh, cross-region and long-term relevance and also the accompanying impl implementation of these projects. In the run-up to this law we still had a decision of the law on Im impact assessments with major changes uh, with respect to procedural economy under the motto of all cards on the table in the oral hearing, meaning that at the end of the oral hearing there is a deadline for this submission of uh, requests uh, for evidence. So now the procedure can also be closed in specific areas. For instance, once water is closed, if early environmental protection is open, nothing else can be submitted. We have also seen some further essential points and I don't want to deal with all the details since time is late. In the end you will see my contact data on these points and I would be happy to be available for further questions. As regards the Location Development Act, this is uh, composed of two parts. The second part, again, two main parts. On the one hand, the procedure to uh, obtain a particular public interest, which must be attested, and then the accelerating special norms. Now, as for the application, 
the Act regulates uh, procedures to obtain the confirmation of the public interest uh, and link them with the Lex Specialis for the General Administrative uh, Procedure Act as well as the Environmental Impact uh, Assessment Act. When is such a procedure relevant for the location? This must uh, uh, have uh, the obligation, carry, bring about the obligation to carry out such an assessment and the application must not yet have been submitted. This must be submitted within three years, so this is being decoupled. When is a project relevant for the location and when is it of particular public interest for the Republic? Whenever we're having particularly positive consequences for the business location in a broader sense. Here we're having a non-complete demonstrative catalogue criteria. I've just picked a few for instance, the over-regional relevance, but also contribution to the uh, mobility and energy transition, com contribution to uh, competitiveness, particularly important for an export-oriented country like Austria, but also, of course, the creation of jobs and the strengthening of economically weak regions. How does this work? Who initiates things? Initiation occurs uh, to the applicant uh, with the Federal Ministry for Digitalization and the Economy, which then uh, commissions other ministries, and the other ministries have four weeks to produce a statement. If they don't produce such a statement, uh, um, this all is uh, considered as a positive statement. So again, here we do have uh, uh, this idea that everything is very strict. And the project is then submitted to the Location Development uh, Advisory Board, uh, composed of six persons from different ministries. And soon, uh, at the end of March, we'll have a constituting session with uh, the president, that is the representative of the ministry, having uh, the final say if uh, uh, the words produced or not. So in this case, Mrs. Gablitz, uh, the uh, president of the board of Begeba, who herself had been very much concerned for a long time, and then the ministries will then come to an annual decision at least once in six months. The public interest uh, is then disclosed uh, in uh, line with the location um, disclosure regulation. Now, what special norms are tied to that on the one hand, and this is the central part, the administrative authority has 12 months to decide. It can either reject the project, can send it back, refer it back, or not. Now, the rejection can only occur if uh, it has doubtless been proved that the project fails to comply with all the preconditions and that these cannot be uh, remedied uh, through further steps. Once the 12 months have expired, the applicant has the chance to then uh, complain before the Federal Administrative Court, court that would be the next instance, uh, regardless of fault. Why am I stressing regardless of fault? Because already we have the Institute uh, of the Complaint for Fault, but here we must prove that the authority is at fault, and that is difficult and uh, also brings up further steps and does not necessarily improve the, um, uh, the general mood for the applicant. And there, there are also acceleration uh, uh, possibilities such as limited speaking time. So, for instance, the uh, chairman can then rule out uh, topics that are not part of uh, the subject matter. It, uh, we might think that this is something natural, and so it is in civil procedures, but unfortunately, it's not the case in administrative proceedings. This law and uh, the amendment sh shall bring up a change. Other accelerating special conditions before the administrative court uh, have as a basic um, norm that uh, once the uh, period has expired, you cannot uh, present any further reasons. So as a parent, you need to include in your complaint what you're complaining about and what is actually here um, 
impaired, everything else is not admissible. Then we must also implement the obligation to uh, promote uh, quick uh, procedures both before either court uh, and uh, in line with this uh, um, code of civil procedures. If you delay your statement out of costs for experts, you also need to split the costs. Uh, if you present an evidence belatedly, you must then uh, bear part of the costs, which is a disciplinary element. Now, the um, transitional conditions are important since paragraph 17, paragraph 2 provides that projects where a decision by the courts of public rights have revoked a decision and um, refer it to continuation before other courts must be applied if the application was made at least three years prior to the entry into force of this federal law. What does that mean? It means that even if a project, because this basically, this Location Development uh, Act applies only to new projects, and as I said, the application must not yet have been submitted, but since so many projects had been in the pipeline for such a long time, it is being said that for these cases, once they've been in the, in the pipeline for at least three years and are back with the authority, we're having the accelerating special norms, as you're now going to see, Based on this, this is the act at one glance, as we have uh, prepared it for our member companies. And you can see in light blue what I had described earlier. That is the procedure to obtain special public interest. And then in dark blue, the accelerating special norms. At the bottom, you can see the timeline. As I said, a maximum of six months to obtain particular public interest and then a maximum of 12 months before the authority and a maximum of six months before the federal administrative court. So in this case, you can see we have a maximum of 18 months instead of 12 years as for the third runway. But then as you might also have learned from the media, we finally have a decision by the Supreme Court and the administrative court has rejected revision. So. Therefore, this uh, procedure is now closed, as is the procedure before the administrative court uh, on the Salzburg line. And in all of these decisions, we can see that there is a change of trends triggered by the reforms of the last uh, six months. The legislator, obviously, is also on the right track, as you can see from a survey on the Act, where 77% say that the uh, population and countries that can act more quickly have a decisive uh, competitive advantage. Three fourths believe that environmental um, concerns can also be handled in shorter procedures, and 78% regard uh, over lengthy procedures as a threat for jobs. The transparency I showed you in the beginning uh, on panel 50 is what you can see here again, but updated. Positive trend is again continued or has taken up speed again since this re these reforms. And uh, we're now looking forward to seeing the first projects that benefit from these reforms. Thank you very much for your attention. Besten Dank, Frau Schreiber. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much. So we now keep our fingers crossed that acceleration really, really happens. And um, this now has concluded this session. We have made up for some time, but unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. And therefore, we now proceed with a very short break and then go on with the next session. I thank the speakers because their presentations were hugely interesting and we're now a bit smarter, everyone. Thank you once again.